Thanks so much. Can, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Now that everybody's all nourished and fed, we can get started. So I want to thank Alberto Cairo, um, Dr. Michael Menino, um, Center for Computational Science, um, and all the other amazing people, Jacqueline, amazing people who made it possible for me to be here today. Um, I actually grew up in Miami, which I'll talk a little bit about. And this is like coming home. This is my first talk in Miami since I started Data for Black Lives three years ago. So very excited. Data for Black Lives is a movement of over 4,000 scientists and activists committed to harnessing the power of data to make concrete and measurable change in the lives of black people. Data for Black Lives began with a vision, my vision, a bold, ambitious, but very possible vision of changing the role that data plays in public life, in the lives of historically oppressed people, and in particular, the lives of black people. We launched with a conference at the MIT Media Lab in November of 2017, and nearly three years in, exactly three years in almost, the vision has grown into a powerful movement of scientists and activists equipped with the skills, empathy, and the ability to create a new blueprint for the future. And we are continuing to grow. This year we are responding to the urgency of the political moment, but also the request of people all over the world to bring the Data for Black Lives mission where they live. The mission to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. This talk is entitled Abolish Big Data. It's also the name of my forthcoming book. It is also a call to action that recognizes that the bullets, police dogs, and fire hoses of the past have become the predictive policing, data-driven voter suppression, and facial recognition of the present. Algorithms and other big data technologies are the engines facilitating the evolution of chattel slavery into the prison industrial complex and have created the crisis for the conditions, the conditions for the crisis that we face at this present moment. The prison abolition movement asks the question, how do we create solutions in our communities without recourse to prisons? In this talk, I apply the same lens to big data. How can we reimagine the structures and the industries that concentrates the power of big data into the hands of a few? And how can we abolish those structures that turn data into a powerful and deadly weapon? This is, of course, not the end, uh, a call to end the use of all data. I actually love data, and I'll talk more about that, but quite the opposite. The call to abolish prisons is not a call to abolish accountability, but the call to abolish a punitive, violent system that simply is not working for society. The call to abolish big data is once again the call to dismantle the oppressive structures and industries that surround its use. Big data is more than a collection of technologies, a vast amount of information and different types of it. It is more than a revolution in measurement and prediction. It has become a philosophy, an ideological regime about how decisions are made and who makes them. It has given legitimacy to a new form of social and political control that has taken the digital artifacts of our lives and found new ways to use them against us. Big data is not new. It is not as novel or as revolutionary as we often worship it to be. It is part of a long and pervasive historical legacy and technological timeline of scientific oppression, aggressive public policy, and the most influential political and economic system that has and continues to shape this country's economy, chattel slavery. I believe today that what, what we face and what we must also name is the data industrial complex, where zip code is destiny. Debt becomes a ball and chain weaponized by complex and obscure financial systems, where data is a strategy to rob people of political power by manipulating elections and censuses, a system and culture where persistent, archaic, and racist notions of risk persist, narratives more powerful and impenetrable than any prison that could ever be built. 
Data for Black Lives was founded on the belief that the opportunity that we have with data to abolish, reimagine, and recreate new structures of knowledge production, new forms of, de of decision making, and new ways of relating to each other are infinite. Because of the enormity of the threat this, that is often seen as scary or unprecedented, the discourse has been sort of negative and fatalistic. I mean, for good reason also. But this does not reflect the agencies of our communities and our movements. We don't want people to give up and to get overwhelmed. We want to create alternatives. To abolish big data once again, in the simplest terms, means to reject the structures that concentrate the power of data into hands of the few and to put it into the hands of people who need it the most. The possibilities of this shift in power became clear to me at a very young age. I learned to collect, analyze, and use data as a high school student because early on I realized that alone we could be ignored, but that there was power in a number. When students at a neighboring high school, I went to North Miami Senior High School, this happened at Edison, which is only 20 minutes away from here, organized a peaceful protest after a school administrator put a ninth grader in a headlock. It made national news, but not in the way that students walking out over gun violence or other forms of resistance on campus is making the news today. I'll never forget seeing footage of SWAT team units flooding the school, of police shoving the small frames of students I grew up with against police cars. On CNN and local news is shown here, the headlines read, riot at Miami Edison Senior High. I knew that unless we found new ways to be heard, to disrupt the narratives that facilitated this level of, of abuse, my future and the future of many other young people would be at stake. When we were turned away at public hearings at the school board and totally dismissed by then Superintendent Rudy Crew, we surveyed 600 students about their experiences and shared the findings in a comic book. For many of the young people we surveyed, that was their first time ever being asked about their experiences in school. And at that moment, they realized they weren't bad kids because they'd been suspended for forgetting their student ID at home or wearing the wrong color t-shirt under their uniform because of a gang affiliation, allegedly. But this was a statewide problem and it was a national problem and it was known as the school to prison pipeline. Four years later, I graduate from college and I return to Miami with a renewed sense of purpose and an arsenal of skills in data collection and research that was urgently needed. I was asked to lead a reproductive justice campaign to address the black infant mortality crisis in Miami. Although the, infant the national infant mortality rate had decreased steadily over the past 50 years, the black infant mortality rate remained con constant. Black babies were three times more likely to die before their first birthday. And as Heather so clearly pointed out, you know, race was not the risk factor, racism was in this case. Mothers in the community knew that this tragedy was connected to hospital policies, such as the aggressive marketing of infant formula and the overuse of, of procedures like cesarean sections, C-sections. But without data, community outcry was ignored. With a very small team of moms, I surveyed over 300 mothers on their experiences at Jackson Memorial Hospital, our local hospital. We weren't able to bring 300 moms into the room with us when we finally got a meeting with the CEO, but they could not deny the data that we collected. A campaign that would have taken years to win was accomplished within months. And today, the lives of hundreds of mothers and babies have been impacted by the changes that we fought for, in particular, ensuring that Jackson became a baby-friendly hospital and ending the overuse of procedures like C-section and most importantly, the aggressive targeting and marketing of infant formula. In the summer of 2013, that very same summer, as when Trayvon Martin's murderer was acquitted, a group of young people occupied the Florida State Capitol under the, the leadership of the Miami Dream Defenders. We spent over a month sleeping on the cold marble floor of the state capitol, not because we wanted to make a blanket political statement, 
but because it had become legal to kill a black child in Florida according to stand your ground laws. The codification of this idea of perceived threat. In all of these experiences, I realized we were not just fighting to change institutions whose policies and practices sought to undermine our lives, but behind those policies and practices, what justified and endorsed these civil and human rights abuses were narratives. Narratives grounded in data. Narratives that also must be abolished while we do this work of dismantling the structures of power that perpetuate them. Perhaps the most harmful narratives surround the notion of risk. The very first time I ever heard the word risk was actually in the fourth grade, right here in Miami. Another student, coincidentally, as we worked in the, our elementary school's computer lab, told me that she was at risk. Being nine years old, immediately, you know, just hearing the word elicited a sense of fear and worry in me. I asked her what she meant. She told me she was enrolled in an after-school program for at-risk students, for kids who were at risk of going to prison, having an unwanted pregnancy at an early age, of becoming involved in gangs, kids who were at risk of dying early. She liked the after-school program, and it was the lack of funding at our under-resourced, predominantly black and immigrant school that offered limited options for extracurricular activities as well as very narrow options for who and what we would become. And this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. While I survived the school to prison pipeline, many of my peers did not, as they had to fight to overcome the material circumstances of their lives, while also being laden with the burden of negative expectations. This is one of my favorite examples of machine learning, very common, used to power autocorrect word editing and synonyms in text editing software. In this, we see the connotations of risk, danger, jeopardy, hazard, gamble, probability, menace. How did a term used primarily in business, insurance, loss prevention, and finance become a label operationalized through policy and weaponized against young people like me and my friend? With the end of the civil rights movement, the war on drugs and the war on communities, as I call it, and, the, and with the introduction of massive legislation to push forward the most violent civil and human rights assaults of our lifetime, mass incarceration, came a wave of research and data to justify the targeted and coordinated efforts to warehouse entire communities into prisons. Super Predators was introduced by social scientist and Bush administration advisor John DeLulio in 1950. 1995. There was a whole theory created around this idea. A new generation, and I quote, a new generation of street criminals is upon us. The youngest, baddest, biggest and baddest generation any society has ever known. Based on all we have witnessed, researched, and heard from people who were close to the action, here's what we believe. America is now home to thickening ranks of juvenile super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more pre-teenage boys who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, deal deadly drugs, join gangs, and, co and commit serious uh, communal crimes. At the core, the problem is that most inner city children grow up surrounded by teenagers and adults who are themselves deviant, delinquent, or criminal. The point of this was to spark panic, to fuel fear and hatred, and, and eventually tough on crime policies that, provide, that prove to be successful in their mission criminalizing young people. But it took years for him to admit what, what we all know, that there was no threat. Many, all of his predictions were wrong. Not only wrong, but they were the opposite of what was happening in our communities and across the nations. In this article, after years of spewing these lies, he talks about how he no longer stands by his research. Um, he's noting his conversion back to Catholicism. But at this point, it's too late. The policies were already in motion. They'd become automated in the American imagination. And John DeLulia was not alone, right? I, I can go through even more examples. Dr. Ira Chasnoff built an entire career off of the crack baby myth, you know? This is based on a study with 23 participants, right? We have researchers in the room. That, that's not enough power, sample size, in order to extract findings. 23, come on, that's crazy. But it was based on a hypothesis 
that was in lockstep with insidious political intentions, and the fear that one day a generation of young people would grow up crack addicted and a burden to society. But the reality again was quite the opposite, right? One of the babies from this study grew up to be a healthy, functioning, and quite exceptional young woman, the first in her family to graduate from college. Poverty, rather than crack addiction, which is a proxy for race, was found to be more harmful in a child's life. And another one, right? This idea around the welfare queen myth. This has been used to totally dismantle our country's safety net, privatize social services, siphon resources. Meanwhile, the real welfare queens are corporations who benefit more from government subsidies than all of the individual recipients combined. In the age of big data, unless we are aware of this history, we risk repeating it. And this is a much more appropriate use of the term risk. But before we can talk about algorithms, which I'll get into now in a little bit, and um, machine learning and the ways in which these myths are being reinforced through computational systems, we really have to get into the history of big data. We have to tell its origin story, right? It does have one even beyond the sort of scientific and neutral uh, stories that we've been told, right? It's largely economic as well and, and political. What were the economic, imperialistic, and colonial contexts that required the level of record keeping, accounting, and surveillance that have come to define the big data practices of today, in particular commercial ones? Contrary to popular belief, slavery was not the antithesis to business innovation, and much of what we know about scientific management, management science, and finance does not come from the factory floor, the railroad, or the steam engine. The big data systems we are familiar with today used to control, surveil, and enact violence to maintain power structures and ensure profit on a global scale originated during slavery. In the 16 and 1700s, the Dutch East and West Indian companies were the largest commercial enterprises in the entire world with hundreds of ships, thousands of employees, countless offices in Asia and the Americas, as well as in Amsterdam, the financial capital of the world in the 17th century. The VOC and WOC's operations were mirrored and brought all over to the US and other companies from other, such, such as the British copied these practices as well. In proportional terms, they were wealthier and more powerful than Apple, Google, and Facebook combined. These companies pioneered colonialism, created the blueprint for globalization, and developed new data practices required to maintain this massive operation. Although this has been largely ignored and erased, these sophisticated big data practices predate the analytical tools we use today. Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal, author of Accounting for Slavery, Masters in Management, writes that planters' control over enslaved people made it easier for them to fit their slaves into neat empirical roles and columns. The abstraction of the catastrophic loss of human life and the necessary torture required to maintain plantations was needed to serve the owners who were removed from the daily abuse of the literal, literal rows and fields of the cotton, sugar, and tobacco plantations they owned. Data moved up and down hierarchies, akin to the ways in which CEOs and boardrooms today are responsible for, but never accountable to the violence they inflict. Big data was necessary to distance oneself from violence and the gore capitalism of slavery. These standardized re reports were used to account for slavery and reflect the legacy of the, and the thorough record keeping practice of the Dutch empire, um, as we can see here. This is a monthly abstract for the plantation disturbingly named Hope and Experiment in Guyana, which is actually where my family's from, that reveals rigorously calculated operations for the month. There was one line for each day with columns for many of the different categories of enslaved men, women, and children. They include in the field, watchmen, house servants, carpenter, ch children, invalid, and, run and runaways. Children's labor was essential to operations of the plantation, and their role was justified by the brutal logic of capitalism as well. And I quote one slave owner, the hand of a, a Negro child is best calculated to extract the weed and grass. This daily process of, de of dehumanization was numerical, and below these monthly abstracts were identical reports for livestock. <laughs> Sorry. 
The Negro account and livestock account use the same methods of taking an inventory, calculating increase and decrease, purchase, sale, birth, death, with little difference, made for man, woman, child, ox, and goat, and cattle. And there's plenty more examples. I really encourage you to read Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal's book. We, I also got a chance to go to Amsterdam and go into the archives and see similar uh, charts and, 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 and graphics and different, different forms such as this. All of these examples indicate the ways in which big data was born out of bondage. They emphasize my earlier point that big data is not new or as revolutionary as we worship it to be, but it's a part of a much larger history that we have to be conscious of. We often say that no algorithm is neutral, that algorithms are opinions embedded into code. And history, especially this history, reveals the extent to which this is true. By definition, an algorithm is a set of step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. A recipe is an algorithm, a list of instructions, or a process to make the dish, the ingredients that make up the dish, and a result based on what we define from the beginning of the recipe as success. Whether we want to focus on making something healthy or something that tastes good, regardless of health benefits. These decisions are, are just determined by a question. What are we optimizing? Computational algorithms are layered, complicated. Their ingredients are not just the raw data that is fed into them, and the result is not as simple as the outputs that come out of them. Scores, ratios, GPS routes, and Netflix recommendations. But as this chart demonstrates, history and values influence inputs and outputs, and very importantly, most importantly, the very models that are trained and developed by the algorithms themselves. One example that I always use are FICO credit scores. Contrary to like common belief, FICO is not a federal agency, but the Fair, Isaac, and Company, a for-profit for entity started by William Fair and Earl Isaac, a mathematician and an engineer, who 25 years ago sought to disrupt the risk and lending industry through the use of machine learning. The inputs to this FICO algorithm, as we are told, are the amount of debt we have, the percentage of missed payments, uh, you know, et cetera. This information, our data, are provided through a, coll a collusion of data brokers, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, and then fed into the FICO algorithm. And while we are told that certain behaviors and financial characteristics comprise our credit score, we're never really able to verify this because FICO is a proprietary algorithm, a black box devoid of transparency with the purpose of displacing accountability away from these for-profit companies that profit from our data. FICO scores reflect the ways in which algorithms hold tremendous power over our lives. Right at this very moment, there are students at the school who will have to drop out because they can't afford to qualify for a subsidized loan. People, families, who are struggling to afford rising transportation costs because they can't afford subprime car mortgage payment, car payments, and even hardworking families facing homelessness because they cannot qualify to rent an apartment, all because of a three-digit number. And these three-digit three digit numbers will increasingly decide whether we should get hired for the job, and even some way if we do not resist, whether or not we'll have a right to attain citizenship or be deported. While it is in violation of federal law to deny people housing, employment, and education based on race, you can't sue an algorithm. And private companies like FICO, who I also must mention is in their best interest to make sure that most people have low scores and others don't, argue that their algorithms don't discriminate. They say nowhere in their algorithm or in their input is race a variable. So how, how are they able to compete for race? How can it be racist, right? That's a question I often get. But what we know about the history of this country, how our neighborhoods and municipalities are organized, you don't need to use race as a variable when redlining and segregation, the legacies of slavery, have made zip codes proxies for race. This is, a good, this is an example from Miami from 1951, um, right? This is a Western Union post that somebody sent very, very clearly talking about fears around uh, black folks and the changing in their communities, right? What is the legacy of this? Only 
several generations after slavery, six million African Americans left the South for the industrial centers of the North, Midwest, and West Coast of, of this country with what is known as the Great Black Migration. As black folks contributed tremendously to the growth of, of the manufacturing industry, in the case of Miami, folks came from Bahamas, Barbados, all over to build and grow full of gables, all these, all these communities. Our federal government responded through policies that sought to institutionalize racist sentiment and permanently entrench black communities into a case like status. Policies that were foregrounded in the most essential part of economic mobility in this country, which is home ownership. In 1933, as part of the Green New Deal, the Homeowners Loan Corporation developed a grading system that deemed some areas desirable while others hazardous. It did not matter that federal law ruled racial zoning unconstitutional. The creation of security maps and the redlining of black communities encouraged the practices of real estate boards, neighborhood associations that made it impossible for black folks to own homes. As so vividly shown in this photo entitled, one of America's first under expressway parks, this set the stage for many of these communities to be the sacrifice zones of today. In a world more concrete, real estate and the remaking of the Jim Crow South, historian ND, NDB Colley the details how in the uniquely diverse context of Miami, the deployment of this grading system was essential in the establishment of a racial hierarchy, reinforced geographically and felt to this day. The Federal Housing Administration opens, opened its Miami offices right here in Coral Gables would send a message right away who these services for and who the administration served. The whites only city, beautiful, the city beautiful as it's called, founded by George Merrick, became the outpost, outpost from where local staffers of the Homeowners Loan Corporation work with FHA officials to expand home ownership. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Where was I? So if we look at this chart, we see the current legacy of this agenda today. Hoke appraisers, not unlike some well-meaning policymakers and social scientists, viewed their grading method as a single unsegregated system and a step towards racial progress. While black neighborhoods, you know, irregardless of being mainly foreign born or even middle to higher income, were given D grades on security maps, assessors by contrast allowed for distinctions between other races, whites, Cubans, and Jews, which each group enjoying slightly different privileges in the, in the Miami housing market. Latins were not Latin Americans, but Italians, and always lived in solidly B neighborhoods, except for those who lived in Coral Gables, who enjoyed an A grade. Cubans, often poor immigrants and those of African descent or who lived in, near, in or near Liberty City occupied D neighborhoods. And while Cubans, Cuban immigrants that lived in high-end homes off of Biscayne Bay found themselves in, in A communities. In the state's eyes, they were variously white or Negro but for the sake of bureaucratic simplicity. Neighborhood grading in the 1930s was hardly a science, but, pro, but the program scientific Trappings help turn popular racial knowledge into real world consequences. This map was a study done by the, um, uh, a really, really prominent researcher out of Harvard where it really, it, it, has, it does an analysis of the outcomes um, for income um, and other outcomes from 1933 to today. 74% of the neighborhoods that were deemed as hazardous given D grades are still lower income and experience a lot of the same um, lack of an opportunity and neglect quite seriously. Zip codes created in the early 19th century to organize the country for the postal service have become artifacts of this history, extending the shelf life of archaic public policies of the past. This is a study that ProPublica did of how people in certain zip codes um, experience and are often impacted by um, predatory practices of the insurance industry, where if you're living in a low-income, working-class neighborhood like Chicago Southside, 
where there's actually not that much crime compared to the downtown commercial center, you're paying way more in car insurance than if you did li live in the downtown commercial center um, and you drive a sports car, right? That's the, actually the analysis that they, sh that they did. And this is a map from where um, the 1933 map of Chicago and the darker purple is where people are paying more car insurance, right? So, so, so this is real implications that began in 1933 where, where literally, you know, people who are part of the Fair Housing Administration and the Homeowners Loan Corporation were allowed to define what race was by geography. And we have codes like zip codes and other forms of proxies for race that have only reinforced that in today's big data practices. And what are other examples of proxies for race, right? This is a um, tool, a questionnaire used by Compass, which develops a lot of the recidivism algorithms, right? There's a whole trend across the country, um, actually in response to the amazing work done by the bail reform movement. Instead of cash bail, folks said, okay, like, let's release people, let's actually make it possible for poor people who are not convicted to be home and to actually get due process. But the response was to introduce uh, recidivism algorithms based on questions like these. And it's kind of blurry, you can't see it, but I'll read some of the questions, right? How many of your friends or acquaintances have ever been arrested? Were you ever suspended or expelled from school? How often have you moved in the last 12 months? Or indicate how much you agree with this statement. Does a hungry person have a right to steal? So when you think about these questions, you think about who's incarcerated in this country, one question is about who's suspended in this country. Um, does a hungry person have a right to steal? I mean, according to this, like I would, you know, fail this questionnaire. Like I should be sitting in jail, right? Um, and I, it's true, right? And I think you look at this, and this is actually being used and fed into an algorithm. And it's why we have people who are career criminals for 40 years, you know, serving less sentences than young people were. Like they got involved in like a neighborhood scuffle, and that was their first offense. So, So for these reasons, I assert the call to action to abolish big data, to reject and dismantle the structures that concentrate the power of data into the hands of a few, and to put the power of data into the hands of those who need it the most. Given what we know, the call to action to become an abolitionist in this era of big data is not simply a political choice, it's an ethical obligation It's an obligation that's grounded ultimately not just ex in exposing these harms, right? So many people do amazing work of exposing these harms, but it's also grounded in critical vision. And this vision is what guides our work. To reclaim data is protest, data is accountability, and data is collective action. So when a coalition of teachers, students, parents, researchers, in the Twin Cities learn that the mayor's office, the sheriff's office, the school district, the foster care agencies were quietly planning a joint powers data sharing agreement to take all these agencies' data and create risk ratios. You know, these folks didn't necessarily know what predictive uh, algorithms were, they didn't understand big data, but they knew that in the context of a, a, of a city like Twin Cities, where there's really, really high inequality, that this could only mean extreme harm for folks um, in their families and, and, and people that they, in their community, right? So they reached out to us and we stepped in and I went down, that's actually me on the sweater there. We stepped in, we helped them organize summits, think about strategy, most importantly, educating folks about the harms of big data, but also the possibilities. And they were able to get the entire big data uh, sharing agreement dissolved in the process, educating, decision makers who didn't really know better, didn't know much about these technologies either. You know, when I got a chance to testify at the uh, Massachusetts hearing against facial recognition, which we hope Massachusetts will, will be the first state to adopt it statewide, you know, I really emphasize that just because a technology is new doesn't mean it's innovative and does not mean that it's beneficial, okay? Definitely not. So when the news also broke that the data of 2.1 billion users was being used as a political weapon in the 2016 election, we led a bold effort to hold Facebook to a new standard. It was simply not enough for Facebook to make sure this never happens again. So I wrote an open letter to Facebook on behalf of the Data for Black Lives movement, where I outlined three demands. One, 
develop a code of ethics that researchers, researchers and staff at Facebook must, uphold, must uphold in the absence of important accountability protections such as the Institutional Re Review Board. The first speaker, Octavio, talked about informed consent, right? Human subjects research. When I did research, everybody here who's involved in that, you have to get, you have to get IRB approval, right? Facebook has access to everybody's data at this point. There's no structures, they have an internal IRB, whatever that means. I'm sorry? In order for them to have access. That's, a, that's right. So even if you don't have a Facebook anymore and you deleted it, you're still susceptible. Two, to hire more black data scientists and researchers. And three, the demand that I'll expand on today, to fully commit de-identified data to a public data trust. A data trust by definition, well, this is also, this is a letter from Cory Booker where he like, uh, um, endorsed our demands. I'm not really, well, Cory Booker, thanks for the support, but it was, it, part of our job was to actually educate people in Senate about um, data trust and about these demands. And this is a result of that Senate strategy, right? So it wasn't just, uh, let's fight Facebook. It was about how do we push the public imagination around these things. So, so by definition, what is a data trust? This is very new, right? It's a structure where, whereby data is placed under the control of a board of trustees, some kind of elected form of government, governance, with a fiduciary responsibility to look after the interests of the beneficiaries. And there are several experiments in data trust right now. A lot of them are happening in the UK and in places like Toronto, not so good examples everywhere, but for example, groups like Algorithm Watch are developing a data donation portal where you can um, donate, personally donate your YouTube or Facebook data and have it used by the commons. There's um, startups like Cover Us US where they're talking about having, you know, uh, their users bring together their data to not only support research but to ensure better, you know, access to healthcare. And our premise around this data trust was really based on the fact that Facebook has given researchers access to developer tools for years to do research on a number of issues, right? And rarely does this benefit anybody, much less black communities and black people and other historically disenfranchised communities domestically and worldwide. If you go on research.facebook.com, which is what I visit, visited a lot when I was starting Data for Black Lives, you'll see the extent and the, the, the rigor and, and, and how robust the analysis of, of these researchers are. Why? Because they have the best data set in the world, right? Big data set, one of the best in the world, right? So we see this as an opportunity for Facebook to use its data to defend the civil and human rights of everybody in this country, especially those whose lives will never be the same because of the actions of the current administration. Federal support for research on urgent public health issues like gun violence, maternal and infant health, heart disease, has all but disappeared. Facebook data made available to researchers and community-led organizations has the potential to fill the gap in publicly available data that, that is outdated, full of errors, and often collected as a tactic of law enforcement with the intention of criminalization and surveillance. And again, when I made this demand to Facebook, I knew that they would not just give over the data, at least not immediately. Our data is their bread and butter, right? That's how they make money. This is why Facebook is free. But the most important part was how do we push these new demands, push these new ideas and new solutions into the public imagination, bring these solutions to our network, right? And really, really empower people with new ideas that can say, okay, we're not just gonna accept a slap on the wrist of Facebook, but there's ways, right? Our data is valuable, right? Our lives are valuable. So if, the, if Facebook is serious about positively impacting the world, this is what I wrote in the letter, it would not restrict access to data because of the missteps of Facebook staff and the deceit of individuals at Cambridge Analytica, but share its most valuable resource it has with the thousands of researchers, activists, organizers, and community who are doing good work with very little. What would it look like for Facebook to partner with black women's health organizations to use sentiment analysis to better understand how to provide support for a mother before a baby dies, right? What knowledge, insights, questions and models can the vast amount of Facebook data we create daily lend to the achievement of racial justice and equity right now? 
I don't know all the answers to this question, but I know people who do. For every Alexander Kogan, Christopher Wiley, and Robert Mercer, there are countless black scientists, researchers, students, and people of all backgrounds with technical skills, vision, and empathy to change the world. This public data trust will create inroads for the public to, re to receive training in data ethics privacy, and privacy, as well as empower community groups to harness the power of the data to make real change in all of our lives. So in May of 2020, we're gonna be convening 15 of the world's like foremost experts. It's a very small group because this is very like kind of a new idea, but of the world's experts in data governance, data trust, um, and activists working on the front lines of uh, racial justice to create a blueprint for what our Data for Black Lives Data Trust would look like. And what's the vision for this blueprint? Like what's the end goal, right? Again, at Data for Black Lives, our focus is not on necessarily not only on changing analytical tools, but the people, the culture, the history that surrounds it. So we're actually, one of the programs that we also put out this year, um, we asked people to come forth who wanted to start Data for Black Lives hubs in their communities, right? And uh, hundreds of people came forth, and these are, some, these are some of the responses. And as an example, people from Syracuse, New York, who are really, really, really you know, concerned, but also see the opportunities um, for resistance, but also for like redirection of resources as Microsoft comes in and tries to make uh, Syracuse a smart city, right? People in St. Paul and Chicago um, and other places who, um, you know, groups of both activists, but also scientists, data scientists, software engineers, who are concerned about what's happening, but also very hopeful about the possibilities. So we're really excited about this, and this is why we want to create structures like Data Trust, because as you know, uh, our, our first presenter talked about as well, open data, you know, it's, it, it's open, but for a lot of people, and it's often weaponized, right? What are the structures, what are the public benefits that can come out of data, something like a Data Trust? And finally, as I wrap up, um, our like kind of landmark uh, thing is our Data for Black Lives conference. For the past two years, we've been convening scientists, activists, folks from all over the country. Dr. Zinzi Bailey came to one of our first ones. Um, and we, yeah, the first one sold out. We had 300 people. The second one, we had over 600, even though I told MIT it was only going to be 450 people. And this year, we're expecting over 800 people, right? And why? Because, you know, folks like, there's the activists who with a little bit of data support and capacity know that they can do so much more with their work. And then there's also scientists, mathematicians, folks who are passionate about what they do, but don't want what they love to be used to harm people and like destroy their lives, right? So that's coming up December 11 to 13, 2020 at the MIT Media Lab. And to kind of wrap up, I bring us um, back to this original question. What are we optimizing, right? A future where the injustices of the past are automated and reinforced? A past defined by slavery, dehumanization, greed, control, violence? Or a future vested in justice, fairness, solidarity? A world where the needs of all people are met? Dylan Rodriguez, professor of ethnic studies, defines abolition as a dream towards futurity vested in insurgent counter-civilizational histories, genealogies of collective genius that perform liberation under duress. And I say, abolition is a process, not an end goal. It is the rejection of prisons as the answer to the most pressing social problems. And it begins in our minds, in our academic institutions, in our families, in our communities, it's a new way of understanding the world. And I believe that abolition is against certainty. It's against permanence. The permanence of the prison cell, the guard tower, the weapon, and its factory. Abolition is about asserting life in a system that demands death, casualties, human bodies as its tribute. Abolition is for us right now while simultaneously being for generations to come. People we may never see, or meet, but we must will into existence, just as our ancestors willed us. I'm confident that a new world is possible, and the world that we can begin building today, right here and right now. And I invite everybody, and I mean everybody, to join us in this effort. I really hope you can be a part of what we're building. Thank you.